Hello again, everybody. I'm Jeremiah Reiner, and thank you for listening in to a brand new episode of Deeply Rooted. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Deeply Rooted. Thank you for joining us, as always. We appreciate you guys tuning in. A brand new episode here for us today. Really excited about the content and the conversation we're going to have. But wherever you're at and however you may be listening, we appreciate you guys being a part of this ministry. We just want to catch you up on a couple of things if you're not aware of it. Make sure you go over and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can see all the archived episodes that we've got on there. We've got some really, really good ones if you want to check those out. and Be sure to share those with others. You can also go on over to our Apple podcast and do the same thing there. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Leave us a review. We'd love to hear back from you. And if you'd like to follow us even more, go on over to our Facebook page. You can check that out there at Deeply Rooted. We put all the links up to our episodes. We do a little daily Bible uh, verse there as well for you and some other announcements that we might have. And if you'd like to get a little deeper into the ministry, Go on over to our website at jeremiahreiner.com. Uh, we've got plenty of blog posts on there for you. Again, you can check out all the previous episodes that we've got from Deeply Rooted. You can also see our ministry schedule right now and see all the updates we've made due to the current circumstances with uh, the pandemic that we're facing and social distancing and the issues that we're seeing right now with uh, some church cancellations and, and some uh, redrawing, so to speak, I guess, of scheduling right now. So, uh, But... All that said, uh, really excited about our content today. Been wanting to get with this guy for quite a while, uh, but we're really excited to have our good friend Ryan Robinette with us today. Ryan and his wife, Tabitha, they live in Lebanon, Virginia. Ryan was born and raised there. He went to high school at Lebanon High School, and he's a graduate of King University. He and his wife are very faithful and active members at Bethel Baptist Church. A lot of great people there. You've probably heard me mention that if you've listened to the podcast any. We've had the Pleasure of speaking there and preaching there and ministering with those people. So a lot of good friends uh, in that part of the area. So, Ron, really appreciate you being on today, buddy. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to talk to you about this. Um, I was thinking about this when we got started, and I thought, man, where is the first time that I met Ron? And then I had to think back, and uh, a lot of people obviously probably don't know this, but Ron's older brother Caleb and I were roommates in college. And I remember meeting Ron, I think, for the first time there. He came over uh, one weekend, and I never met the guy. He hadn't even spoken a word. I just remember him wearing a really cool North Carolina jersey. And I thought, <laughs> man, this guy's got to be great because he's a Carolina fan. So I immediately thought, he's got to be awesome. I mean, he's Caleb's roommate, and he's wearing a Carolina jersey. So you had my vote of confidence right off the bat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Carolina faithful for a long time now. It's, it's kind of weird because I cheer for Virginia Tech and football, but for some reason I've always liked North Carolina when it comes to basketball. It may, it may have something to do with Michael Jordan. Though. I do the exact same thing. I'm a Carolina fan for basketball and a Hoagie fan for football, and I know there's a lot of haters out there that don't like that, but that's okay. Uh, we're not here to please everybody, so <laughs> it is what it is. We're good in, in each other's books. So um, I want to go ahead and go back and, and get to kind of the, I guess, the theme of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I love a good testimony. I love a good story of God's grace. I love a good story of healing, and that's what we've got here today. So I encourage you to stay with us. I think you're going to be really blessed by this when we talk about Ryan's story. But uh, Ryan, going all the way back to the beginning, and we'll just walk people through this, um, you were seemingly born pretty healthy, and then at about four months old, everything kind of changed. Um Explain to everybody what DCM means, and how would you describe the diagnosis that you were given at four months? Okay, um, so dilated cardiomyopathy is the is the the long name for DCM. It's it's basically an enlargement of the of the left ventricle of the heart. The left side of the heart is the is the pump muscle that works to supply the blood throughout the body. Um, so the the left the left ventricle muscle becomes like an overstretched rubber band and it loses its elasticity it, it, its function is decreased in my condition the by the time i was 4 months old I, I was my heart muscle was so weak that i was in congestive heart failure i spent 2 weeks in the icu at that age 
and I was then sent to a, to a cardiac evaluation in Vanderbilt after dis, after discharged. Now, you said something in a blog post that you um, have been writing on lately, and I've been following. It's been really good. Um, a, a mutual friend of ours who works in the healthcare industry has got you doing that there for some hospice care patients, kind of sharing your story. And I, I wanted to share this with the audience of what you said on there. Um This is the quote. It said, the average heart beats 115,000 times a day, and during an average lifespan, your heart will beat up to 3 billion times. The doctor said I would never have enough strength to walk, and to put that in perspective now would be to say that I should never have lived to see my 26th birthday, and if I did, I would be disabled. Um, I remember reading that and thinking, my gosh, like, A, you know, a lot of great information there, but B, I don't think I understood the severity of how bad it was and the condition you had at that time. Yeah. Um, that it, it's really just, it didn't really affect me until, until I was 15, 16 years old. I mean, I lived with this and cl- only cr- close friends of mine even knew I had the condition. Like if you pass me in the halls at school, you think I was just like anybody else. And then one day um, I'm at a, I, I, me and my brother Caleb, we went to a, an Alabama and Kentucky football game. And we, we had season tickets that year to, to Kentucky. And we were climbing steps at the game. And I'm just like, what is wrong with me? Like, I, I mean, I'm, I consider myself decently athletic. I, I, I played sports all throughout high school and, um, and all before that. And I was constantly in – physical activities and playing around with friends in the neighborhood and playing around with friends all the time. And I'm, I'm struggling to make it up these steps at this football game. I was like, what is wrong? And then after the game, I, all the way back home, I just lay in the car in, in the back seat and um, something's not right. And I get, I get back to the house and I, I tell my mom, I was like, something's wrong with my heart. I mean, I know it's gotta be my heart because I've never felt like this before in my life. So it just, it, it was just like a, a, a switch got flipped and everything that I knew about myself just changed right there in that moment. How old were you when you actually, I guess, could comprehend that you had a heart condition? You know, we talked about they, they basically diagnosed you at four months, but how old were you when you realized, hey, you know, there's some things about me that I've got to be very conscious of? Um. So I, so I took some medicines and stuff from, from the very beginning, as far back as I can, I can remember being able to take medicine on my own. I could, I realized that my heart wasn't like other people's hearts. Uh, And I I was going to, I was going to the doctor and on yearly visits, like, I mean, it wasn't something that was a constant issue, but I, I knew that there was something there that was, that was different about me than other people. So it, it was always in my mind that I had the condition, but like I said, I didn't want to use it as an advantage, so I, so I never took advantage of it. And but I always knew it was there, and I always it, it kind of frightened me a little bit to, to the aspect that that something might happen to me if I if I don't listen to my doctors, if I don't listen to my parents, and so so I, I constantly had that in my mind, but I never let it stop me from going out in the yard and playing football just as hard as everybody else <laughs> did you modify your life i mean you know you're, you're talking about this condition and this medication you're taking did that did that change the way you had to play sports or at school and and time with friends and vacations and, and going away or something like that um well to be honest with you football would have been my go-to sport that's that that's the sport that i loved the most sure growing up and it killed me when my parents wouldn't let me play and Every year, I still have this hope that when I go back to the doctor, that the doctor's going to let me play at least basketball this year. That's not a contact sport. <laughs> and and at least one day, I'll get to the point where I'll be able to play football. I mean, that was constantly what I wanted to do, but that wasn't going to happen. No contact sport was, was ever going to happen for me. It wasn't even a possibility. And But I still had this hope that maybe basketball one day. So I stuck to, to baseball, which I love baseball. I had to wear a, a chest protector um, to, to prevent collisions and, and impacts from the ball and stuff. And then um, I played golf. But um, as far as um, sports go, um, yeah, that, that was kind of tough. And um, 
going on to school, I mean, like I said, I, I didn't, I was kind of, I don't know if I would call it a shame to tell people because I didn't want them to look at me any differently. I mean, right. when you're in, when you're in high school or, or things like that, if you tell someone you have a heart condition, they might be like, I'm going to stay away from that guy <laughs> or what's wrong with him. What caused that? And so, I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't mention it to anybody. I mean, coaches were the only people that knew anything about my condition. And so, so school didn't really have an impact on me at all. I mean, I was still, a heart condition didn't prevent me from anything academically. Um, medication, I took three different medications at that time. I mean, aspirin, just simple aspirin, Lasix to help with, with fluids. And I took um, just a small dose of medicine that, that prevented a further damaging of the heart. Did you get... Yeah frustrated i guess you know on the doctor visits and and thinking my gosh you know why can't i I just play this sport i mean was that something that just continued to eat away at you it was very frustrating especially i mean you all you being from this area you know if you're a football player you're you're a cool person no doubt (laughs) or um not being able to compete in sports and then here i am going to school wearing jerseys and am I am I just the person who thinks they know a lot about sports, or does he play sports and can compete in sports? Sure. So yeah, it was kind of it was kind of belittling to myself too, just knowing that I couldn't be somebody in sports, or I couldn't couldn't get out there and compete with my friends. I wasn't going to be in that that group of people that 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 can compete at a high level in sports. Even though I mean, I played baseball, and I feel like I done really well in baseball and golf. But still, just football is that thing that I really wanted to do the most. I found this to be true a lot of times, spiritually speaking. The enemy loves to kick people when they're down um, and and really make a scene out of already a difficult situation. Um, You know, the Bible tells he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And there's a lot of things he steals, and there's a lot of things he destroys. And I think one of them is people's joy and and just their good livelihood. Um, Did that ever lead you to get mad at God? During that, I gotta be honest. I mean, I never blamed God for any of that. I mean, it never even occurred to my mind that God cheated me out of being able to to do what other kids done. It's, I mean, I may I may have looked at sometimes and been like, "Why me?" I mean, why can't I compete? But I mean, I never really looked, and I was like, "God, you did this to me. What am I supposed to do now?" And so I don't really feel like there was an ever an anger towards God for the whole situation. No. Now let's go back. You you talked about you were 15. You're at that stadium. Obviously, there's a big scare there. You're, you're going up those steps, and something's clearly not right. You're riding home. Um, is that around the time that, that you begin to understand, maybe I need a heart transplant, or did they already talk to you guys about that? Not at all. I mean, I haven't. I hadn't heard the word heart transplant before in my life. <laughs> I mean, I had no idea that heart, heart transplant would even be an option. It's I didn't know what was wrong with me. And when you're 15, 16 years old, you're not thinking heart transplant. You're thinking, I mean, how am I going to be cool in school? What am I going to do now? How do right. I get my friends to pay attention to me? Uh, how do I, how am I going to be popular and stuff like that? And uh, what's coming on TV? I'm not thinking about I'm going to have to have a heart transplant to survive. <laughs> now, in that situation, is that when they begin to explain to you guys, you know, we may need to take a serious look here at his condition, and it was the word heart transplant, you know, brought to your all's, you know, uh, table at that time? So, um, so, so that week when I got back from – from the game that night, I ended up getting admitted into to Russell County Medical Center, and um, I, I stayed. I, I was immediately shipped over to Johnson City, and they kept me for seven or eight hours. Noticed that I was in heart failure, sent me, put me on a private jet, and flew me straight to Vanderbilt. So things escalated very quickly, and I met. They ran tests on me for about a week in Vanderbilt, and then they decided that. Right then, their heart transplant was going to be the only way I was going to survive. And um, so, we go from not even not even thinking about heart transplant, not even considering that a scenario, to you have to have this to survive. And 
I mean, there was some there was some mentioning of maybe a not a pacemaker, but like a um, something to, to keep my heart back in rhythm. Um, but that I mean, that's that didn't last very long. It was heart transplant or, or boom. <laughs> Now, did they keep you in Vanderbilt at that time, or did you, you know, they put you on a list and you go home and it's a waiting game, or is it you have to stay here? I got put on the top of the list as soon as they found out how severe my heart problems were, and I never left my room in Vanderbilt. I was in the children's hospital there in Vanderbilt, and I never left my room for three months. And how old were you when that happened? I was put in there when I was 15. Okay. And... Obviously, there's a lot that comes with that. You mentioned, you know, three months there. What was that experience like? There was some ups and downs for sure. Um, I, I can't go without mentioning, first of all, my family. I mean, it just goes to show you how important family is during that situation. I mean, my, my, my mom, she slept in a pull-out chair for three months, never wow. left my room. And... Um, and, and, and just going on from that, you got people that her job was very supportive. People she worked with donated their vacation and their sick hours to her to allow allow that to happen. And then um, my dad traveled back and forth. I mean, he had he was running two businesses at the time. I mean, was self employed, so he couldn't quit his job. I mean, he would lose everything. So he he come down there back and forth probably two times a week. I mean, driving five and a half hours to Nashville two times a week just to see me. And, and you know what's on his mind. I mean, I'm, I've been told I'm having a heart transplant. There he is having to drive five and a half hours a week. And then my, my grandmother stayed there constantly with me. She, she never left. They, um, they checked her into the, to the Ronald McDonald house right beside of me. She stayed there. She ran errands for us constantly. She walked the streets of Nashville, my 80 year old grandmother <laughs> getting us whatever we needed whenever we needed it. And if I say I wanted this to eat, she's finding pizza when I want pizza. <laughs> so I mean, just a, a champion the whole time and nurses, I made great friends with nurses. I had nurses that, um, that would sit down and watch a football game with me and, <laughs> and would play a board game with me and just, but the thing down there is you had a nurse that was – you were so severe that you had a nurse that just looked over you the whole day. So you built relationships with these nurses. No they doubt. They had one responsibility, and that was you. <laughs> so I had a nurse that sat right outside my room all day long, and I was able to to, to speak with my friends all the time. I, I was fortunate enough to have Xbox Live in my room. <laughs> <laughs> so I played Call of Duty with all my friends and, and sports games with all my friends. I actually played um, – Tiger Woods, PJ Tour 2009 with my doctor, the one that performed the heart transplant, sitting in my room playing with me <laughs> with that. And I had a doctor that would take me up on the on the helipad. I, here I am carrying my pole hooked up to all these machines, IVs running out of me, and he's pushing me around the helipad. So illegal. He can't even do that anymore. <laughs> he told me that he got in trouble for this. <laughs> now, you mentioned in your blog story and I was reading about that because you just mentioned about the nurses and the doctors and and I wanted to ask you something because I thought this was pretty profound uh, when I was reading over your story you said that there were a lot of times or multiple times that the doctors would literally ask you if you were ready Um, how did you deal with that I mean you're 15 years old and here we are asking you you know if this doesn't work are, are you prepared to die that's in my mom's word it made me angry (laughs) she said that she would see me go from joyful to angry i mean here i am i have my my brother and his wife coming down there trying constantly to cheer me up do whatever it takes to to lift me up and then that evening a psychiatrist would come in the room and ask me if i was ready to die so the first thing that that it gets me thinking is what happens to the people that don't have the supporting cast that I had? Sure. I mean, what what does what does something what does asking someone if they're ready to die do to somebody that doesn't have a family and doesn't have a, a spiritual background that that I had telling me everything's going to be okay? God's watching after you, and my 
and my my brother constantly uplifting me, sitting right beside me the whole time. I th- I thought it was a horrible question to ask someone that age. No, it made me angry. <laughs> oh no doubt. Um, now let's let's go into the positive news here. Obviously, we're sitting here talking. And that's that's years ago, so I don't think it's a stretch to for people <laughs> listening right now of what obviously is going to take place, but. Where were you, and, and what do you recall about when you found out that you did have a donor? The whole donor thing right now is probably the hardest thing for me to look back on. Um, the uh, It's the hardest thing now, but back then I wasn't, think, I wasn't really even thinking about what it required to be a donor. Like, I'm just thinking, all I have to have is a heart to survive. I'm not thinking that someone had to die for me to right. get that. So, um, that whole um, donor, being a donor is a wonderful thing. And um, and now that I look back at it, it just makes me, it makes me wonder and, and makes me sad to think about someone else had to die for me to live. And, um, yeah, that uh, it, it's a wonderful process, but it, it's hard to... It's hard to comprehend once you get past that and you look back and you start thinking what all had to happen for, for things to come together. And and what and, and the family, they had to lose somebody. And 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 really I don't know much about that donor. Um it, it's kind of I mean it's I mean I can understand where parents are coming from, but uh, my donor um chose to remain anonymous and um so, so I didn't really know much about them. Um I know that they were um 16 years old, same time, same age as I was at the time. The, um, their heart never stopped beating the whole entire time from the, I, I know it was a car crash and it never stopped beating from the time it left his body to the time it got to mine. Wow. And it was a perfect match. Same. I mean, everything was perfect. How long was the procedure? And, um, I guess a follow up to that, what in the world was going on in your mind leading up to that procedure? The procedure was, about five or six hours. Um, and uh, to be honest, it was a madhouse <laughs> at that time. Um, I, I remember the night that, that I got a, that a doctor come in my room and told me. And I was, I was playing Xbox Live with about six other friends at the time. And here I am. I'm in my room yelling like it's a war zone in there. <laughs> <laughs> and here he comes in there, and I pause it, and he tells me what has happened. And it's just like cheer came all over my whole family's face that was in the room and it's like excitement and cheer at the same time and i i remember turning on my my microphone for my xbox and i was like guys i gotta go i got a heart <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it was like silence on there i mean you can't even get a word in on there normally at, with six people and then it's like no one says a word and then someone says what i was like yeah you heard me <laughs> so yeah it was a a truly a life changing experience that I'll never forget. It was a mad rush from there on until until the time that it happened, but it was it was great. What was the recovery process like? Did you have to go through a lot of physical therapy after that? The recovery process was brutal. <laughs> um, I was on a ventilator. I had chest tubes, um, atrial lines to monitor my blood pressure, multiple IVs. Um, I was given high doses of medication to stop my body from rejecting the new heart. Um, I was on uh, medications that caused me to hallucinate. Um, that was, I mean, I had hellish dreams. Like, I thought I was in hell multiple times. Like um, Dreams that I would wake up. I mean, just like, I don't even know if I'm alive right now. <laughs> and, and if I was alive, it was in hell. And um, so it was tough. And, I mean, I was in a lot of pain. I know my family, it, it was tough for them because, I mean, they told me moments that they would come in the room right after the transplant was over, and every time my heart would beat, I would jump. My bed was literally shaking, and I was, I was jumping so much. Like, it was like my, my bed was hooked up to electricity. There was that much going on in my body at the time. I was hooked up to so many machines that I had family coming in the room, and they, they couldn't even stand the look of it. They had to walk out and leave. So it was, it was a brutal experience. On after, they they actually forced me to get up and and do things. Um, three or four days after the transplant, they had me getting up and walking, and um, they would push me around 
the 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 ICU area there. I had the one whole floor in the cardiac area. I was really the oldest person there by a long by a long way. Most of it was babies. Wow. And 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 they had me walking around that whole area pushing my my IV pole, and I was just like, I don't want to do this. I didn't know where I was at. I was in pain. I felt like I was barely standing up, and then they had me walking and doing that stuff. And on after that, I got moved to the Ronald McDonald House, and um, I had I couldn't even sleep on my stomach. Like my, I mean my my chest and my diaphragm had been cut open and stitched back together. So it was so much pain to even lay on my stomach or lay on my side. I had to lay flat on my back constantly, and that was a huge adjustment. Getting to, I mean, to learning how to sleep again, and 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 how to adjust to that stuff. Now, how how important at that time was your faith? I mean, surely that had to be something that you were holding on to pretty hard. That was that's the most important thing through it all. I felt like the the presence of God during all that was more real to me than than the people in the room. I mean, it was, he never left my side during the whole entire thing. Yeah. And I was constantly reminded, I mean, I wouldn't even given, I would say I wasn't, I wouldn't even have been given the, the opportunity to forget God. If I wasn't thinking about it, my family would remind me, friends would remind me, my church would remind me, my community, my, the walls in my room were covered in posters and cards. And I was getting so many letters and People were praying over the phone. They would call me, and my I was getting text messages constantly. I mean, uh, uh, prayers. I mean, it it was amazing. So definitely, my the the presence of God through all that is the main reason I got through the whole thing. I want to share this specific line you wrote in your blog testimony. I was reading it over this morning, and I'd like you to explain a little bit more about it and what you meant by it. But I wanted the audience to hear this because I thought it was so well written, and I don't. I'll put it this way. You don't hear a lot of people talking this maturely about things like this. And Ryan wrote this in his testimony. We don't always get the opportunity to look back over the events of our journey to see the beauty and the suffering. But when we can, even with our limited human vision, it can be an amazing thing to truly realize that the Lord was traveling right along with us, growing our faith, leaning in to hear our fears, knowing all our needs, and sending love and support, being our Father. I thought that was really well written, especially that first part there, seeing the beauty in the suffering. Talk a little bit more about what you learned during that time. Well, I think it tells who God is. I mean, if someone needed a a meaning of God, the first thing that would come to my mind is a father. I mean, yeah, I have my dad here, but he is our... He's our heavenly Father. He's he's why we're here. He's the reason we're alive. Right. I think what I was trying to say is that God never leaves us. He He knows our every need. He knew my family's every need. I mean, this was just as much of an experience for my family as it was me. And He knew their every need. He knew. I mean, and He was always there for me. And I think it goes to show also that no suffering is in vain. Sure. That anything you do, anything that that you go through in life has a purpose. And and ultimately, if you if you go through that purpose the right way, that, that God will make it work out to the way He wants it to work out. Absolutely. Um, you know, looking ahead now, and obviously you're on the the back side of this, and and thankfully for that, and, and all praise goes to the Lord in that regard. Um, what changes, if any, I guess, have you had to make since your procedure? There's not many, there's not many physical, I, I mean, limitations or anything that I have really. I mean, I, I could pretty much do anything I want. I mean, this the situ, the situation that we're in now kind of speaks for itself. I'm I'm a high risk person. I right. mean, I, I mean, you're not going to catch me out at, at Walmart shopping during all this. I mean, <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, I have um, Tabby has been very supportive uh, during all this. She's the one that makes the grocery store visits for me. <laughs> um, so I'm a, I'm a very high risk person. My, I'm taking drugs to fight against my immune system, and when you think about that, that's that's hard to even imagine. Right. That our body creates these. I mean, an immune system to fight off viruses, and here I am taking drugs to fight off my immune system. <laughs> so so how does it all work? So, so yeah, um, 
I, I, that's a, I mean, that's a, something that that's always in my mind is um, I, I got to keep it in mind that I'm, I'm more at risk to get certain viruses, um, become exposed to more things. Um, as far as physical demands, I mean, I'm told not to, not to power lift, which people that see me know I don't power lift anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> so no power lifting for me. Um, you're not going to catch me out running a marathon. That, that's also for my wife. Um, she don't want to face me in a hundred yard sprint but you're not going to, you're not going to see me out running long distances and stuff. Um, the nerve endings on my, my, uh, on my heart were connected, are connected to my donor heart, but it's still delayed in my heart rate. It takes a little bit longer for my heart to catch up. So I can, I can run a hundred yards and my heart won't know I've done it yet. So it, it, it's kind of, it's kind of a little bit different to, to understand, but, here I am running a hundred yards and then 10 seconds later, I was like, Oh my goodness. I just ran another hundred yards when really I just ran a hundred yards two minutes ago. Right. It, it's a little, it's a little bit different to get used to, but I mean, what do I have to complain about? <laughs> Well, it's an amazing story, uh, no doubt, and you talked about, you know, limitations. One thing you're not limited on is playing golf. I know we do that <laughs> way too much now. You and I play quite a bit, you and your brother and I, and we do that often. So it's yeah. good to see you out there and still be able to participate. And like you said, if if you never knew Ryan Robinette, you, you would never know what God had done in your life because, you know, the stories behind the shirt there and – you could tell people about that testimony that there there once was a 15 year old kid seemingly on death row um and the lord out of nowhere intervened um and changed your life for the better um i just want to conclude because i, I thought you mentioned something that was really impactful and you talked about your story and you mentioned it here today too you said that the donor um uh, it was a perfect heart uh, that really stood out to me because you know your story is also this perfect picture of this spiritual heart transplant that everybody needs because apart from Christ, we're all in desperate need and we need a complete transplant. Um, Our sin nature, it's doomed us all to an eternity separated from a holy God and only the sacrifice of a perfect substitute, Jesus, is going to save us. And just as Ryan was given the heart of another so too, you and I, we, we need the heart of Christ to replace ours. And He's willing, He's able, uh, He's ready to do so, I believe that. And by faith, we come to Him in repentance to seek that forgiveness, turn from sin, put our full trust and allegiance in Christ. And you say, well, what's the return benefit of that? Well, everything. Uh, you get a new heart, you get a perfect heart, you get a new mind, you get a new eternal destination in heaven, you get right standing before a holy God, you get a lifetime of grace and mercy, and as Ryan talked about, you get a father who will never leave you and never forsake you, and I just think that's the perfect trade-off. Um, I, I look at your story, and I think, man, what a perfect picture of the gospel. Uh, someone in desperate need who couldn't help themselves, and if it were not for the sacrifice of somebody else, we wouldn't be here. Um, so, you know, I love that story. I wanted to get that out there to people. Man, I appreciate you being with us today and taking time out of your schedule. Um, you know, I know it's interesting circumstances. Normally, I'd love to sit down with people in person, but we're doing this over a uh, Zoom interview, which is new to us. So we appreciate you being a part of us. So, Ryan, thank you so much, man. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, no problem. Uh, Ron's been a big supporter of Deeply Rooted since we got started, so I, I knew I had to get him on here eventually. But um, we're glad we could do it now. And, and I would highly encourage you to share this with other people. Uh, you know, we live in a, her- a world right now where there's not a whole lot of hope, it seems like, and people get very down and depressed, and they get negative and angry towards God, and they've got a lot of questions and seemingly not a lot of answers. Uh, this is a great reminder. There is a God in heaven who cares. And one thing I've learned, and I think Ryan can testify to, he cares more than we care. Um, And the stories that you just heard from Ryan, the countless people that he mentioned, all of those people prayed, and all of those people got an answer to prayer. And God did that individually. So not just for Ryan, but for other people. There was a mom involved, and a dad involved, and a brother, and a sister-in-law, and doctors, and nurses, and grandparents, and friends, and all kinds of people involved there that God was looking out for each and every one of them, including Ryan. 
Uh, so no doubt when we listen to this, I, I just hope you understand God does care. He is compassionate, and He is so compassionate that He has sent His Son Jesus to sacrifice Himself in our place so that we, much like Ryan, um, could have somebody substitute in our half so that we might go on and live. And as Jesus said, not just live, but have abundant life. I believe that. Ryan's living that out right now. So we appreciate him being a part of the program today. Uh, We're going to come right back with some closing announcements, so hang tight with us. Hey everybody, thanks again for tuning in for our new episode of Deeply Rooted. We want to say a big thank you and appreciation for Ryan Robinette for being on today with us. We really appreciate him, his testimony, and his friendship. Uh, We appreciate his encouragement here for all we're doing at Deeply Rooted in the ministry. And again, like we said before earlier, uh, make sure you go on over and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Share that with some other people. Give us a like on there and do the same thing if you go on over to our Apple podcast deeply rooted there as well hit the subscribe button make sure you leave us a review don't forget about our facebook page if you haven't already be sure to follow us there on that share that with other people get some daily encouragement there and also the reminders about any time that we upload our episodes and if you want a little bit more information and some detail uh, on our ministries you can go on over to our website at jeremiahreiner.com Uh, There you'll find our blog post. You'll also find all of our archived episodes for Deeply Rooted. You can also check out our ministry schedule as well, so be sure to do that. And if you'd like to reach out to us, we'd love to hear from you. One of the easiest ways you can do that, you can catch us there on our Facebook Messenger if you'd like to send us a prayer request or some information, uh, maybe suggestion about a topic you'd like to hear us cover, something along those lines. Or you can email us. Our email address is drigw18 at gmail.com. Again, that's D-R-I-G-W-18 at gmail.com. We appreciate you tuning in as always, and until next time, we hope you have a fantastic week in Jesus.